All right, it is four o'clock. We're gonna get started, try to get you guys out of here on time at six o'clock. Um, let me just kind of go over some logistics on how the evening's gonna work. Uh, first off, thank you all for signing up to be a robotics coach. Uh, I realize some of you uh, volunteered for this and some of you were put in a position by your principal to say, I'm gonna become a robotics coach. So um, uh, don't worry, whatever, whatever, any category you fall under, um, we're, we're here to help. We're gonna make this as, um, as smooth as possible as you become a robotics coach. Um, so let me just kind of go over what you see on the screen. You should all be able to view my screen. I'm going to go over uh, and use this screen throughout the day, uh, the evening. Um, really quick, I've muted all of you. You'll stay muted. You can't talk to me, but you can chat with me. And um, since there'll be up to 20 or 24 people to this evening, uh, if you have questions in the chat, uh, you can ask questions. Bree, my coworker, is monitoring all those questions uh, throughout the evening. So if you have questions, Bree will be there. I will tell you she has mommy duty right now, so she's also with her little baby, Juliet. Uh, so if you don't hear from her right away, be patient. She's dealing with Juliet um, at, at the moment. Um, she'll answer any questions. If it's a question that is important for everyone to, uh, or for me to address, she's gonna message me to say, you know, address this even further. But you guys can listen to me, um, follow the screen, and monitor the chat as people ask questions. I'm gonna try to make this as engaging um, as possible. Uh, so uh, to keep this interactive, Try to keep you guys awake. I know this is, you guys had a long work day probably today, so some of you guys even might be on fall break, so thanks for giving up your fall break with us. Uh, but just to kind of get a quick uh, pulse, why don't you guys say hello in the chat? Just say hi. Uh, so I, I see that you're live, and uh, and I say hi, Deb, and to see that you guys know where the chat is. So there should be a screen on the, on the right side here, and a little window here where you can you can click on people uh, to chat. So there should be a little bubble right here on your window for you to chat. So right now I only see Deb saying hi. It makes me a little worried that no one else knows how to chat. Oh, I just need to scroll down. All right, great. Kathy, Juliet, Sam, awesome. Thank you, Sandy, great. All right, I've got people, they're listening, wonderful. Also let you, I sometimes don't like to tell people this um, because they won't pay attention, but I am recording this. I do talk fast, I have a lot of information to give you. Um, this is typically a four hour session that I'm gonna cram into two hours. So uh, if I had eight hours, I probably could talk for eight hours about everything, um, but we're gonna cram it into two, and I'm going to be showing you throughout the evening so many resources for you so that when you have questions, you know where to go, and also know that Bree and I um, we're here to support you. We're here to help you. We don't ever want you to feel like you're alone or you don't know where to find answers. Um, so I'm going to dive in. Please ask questions in the chat. Uh, Bree will help as much as she can and then throw them to me uh, when we need to move on. So, all right. Um, the robot team consists really of three people. So me, I'm George Geltner. I'm the, <laughs> this is actually old. We have new titles now, but for now, we'll just say I'm the State Director of Robotics for TechPoint Foundation for Youth. Um, and just really quick background about me. I was on a robotics team in high school, and then it inspired me to study electrical engineering at Purdue. And my junior year, I switched into education and became a technology education and taught tech ed for 10 years at the high school level. And during that time, I was a robotics coach. So I've been plugged in and involved with robotics for now almost, it's scary to say, for almost 20 years. Um, I think it's one of the best things we can provide for our students. So what you're about to get involved in is gonna be some of the best, most rewarding things that you can provide for your students. So that's why I'm so thankful and passionate that you guys are doing this for your school. Um, and so uh, so anyway, that's, that's me, that's my background. Bree uh, communicates, as she is right now, through chat and email. So, um, she has a lot of behind the scenes. Um, she sent you the homework assignment, hopefully that you did. She'll be monitoring and checking that you did the homework, which was registering your team and you were supposed to watch a couple videos. She'll, any email that you get, it probably came from Bree. When you ask questions to Robot Grant, that's coming from Bree. So she um, is in a very supportive role, helping make sure that you guys are 
um, getting what you need and doing what you're supposed to be doing. Um, and then we have another gentleman that you'll you'll want to know. His name's Andy Fulton. Um, he's a volunteer and event coordinator, and his role is to help volunteer, help find volunteers for each of you. And we'll talk about this, how this works. Um, but you'll, there'll be an opportunity for you to, um, we send out an email basically saying who needs extra help, um, whether that's just another parent, another uh, technical mentor, someone that knows how to code or program, um, we'll do our best to help find a volunteer for you. So take advantage of that. Um, we can't promise it. There's over 1,500 teams in the state and we're li located in Indianapolis. So we don't know everyone in the state of Indiana and says we can pair you, but we will try hard to find you a volunteer. So that's a good person for you. So we're the robot team here to help you. All right, main objectives today. Um, this two hour session is for anyone who has never ever uh, been a robotics coach. So in the chat, I'd like to see who has never coached a robotics team ever? So just say, I've never coached a robotics team, or if you have, just say, I've coached something. Um, I've coached Lego League, or I've coached for two years, or whatever it might be. So I'd like to see how many years of robot experience do you guys have? Never coached, never coached, never. That's, that is the most common thing I hear, and, that, and that's okay, that's what we're here for. Um, how many of you are really nervous? How many of you are scared? How many of you are nervous or scared about what you're about to do? Oh, good. Richard's been involved. Good. I'm excited. Good. What? Awesome. So um, if you're nervous, you're nervously excited. That's good. These are all common feelings that we get. Um, Bree and I have been doing this for three years, and 97% of the teachers um, have never ever been a robotics coach or not even know what robotics is and we've helped train over I don't remember the number, but I want to say it's over 800 teachers and we have over 1500 teams um, So we're putting this training together to not just say hey, you got a robot grant. Here's your robot parts figure it out We're here to say here's the things you need to know your very first year and then um, just to get you started and then to know when you have questions, we're here to help. And then next year, when you're ready to start getting competitive, um, we're here to say, we have a, we actually have another training that we do for um, second and third year coaches that we do in person and we videotape it and we send that out as well. So just plenty of resources and, and, and information to help you feel more comfortable. Um, but anyway, main objectives today is to help give you more confidence that you can do this. And as I said, with 1,500 teams, over nine, eight, eight or 900 teachers, um, all elementary, middle school, 97% have never done this before. They've done it, you can do it. Everyone's been here. It's a nice robot community that we support one another. I'm gonna let you know that, that you can do this. Um, and then knowing that we are here to help. Um, I don't ever, it will feel at times if you don't have any support, you don't have a, another assistant, another coach uh, helping you, you're going to feel alone. I don't want anyone to ever feel alone. I want you to know that you always have an email. Um, that you can ask us questions. Um, there's going to be a slide in this presentation that says, uh, you know, there's seven ways to get help. We're number seven. It's kind of the ask three and, and then me. We want you to ask six and then us. So we're not you're going to be your first line of, of help, but uh, know that we are on that list of seven ways to get help. Um, this entire PowerPoint, I'm going to, you guys want to, if you want to pull up the internet, I'm going to show you the internet. This is what the internet looks like. Uh, you can go to techpointyouth.org, and I'm going to kind of pull this up throughout the evening. And you can follow along with me. You know, if you want to go to techpointyouth.org, go to robotics, robot resources and scroll all the way to the bottom, there is a PowerPoint here. It's not 100% exactly like I'm showing today. It's a modified version, but it is pretty darn close. So you can kind of thumb through this as I go along. You can see that's where we were earlier. Um, so this is gonna be a, a resource to you. And then I will reference, if you scroll to the top of that page, I'll be referencing these links all night long. Um, so coaching resources, there's videos, 
I told you I'll be posting the video of the, this video in case you have to run to the bathroom or miss something. This video will be posted on this new Vex IQ coaches training video YouTube playlist. That, if I clicked on it, that will be posted on this playing list. And uh, not only will this one be posted, but even my in-person videos are all broken down um, in, in this playlist here. And you can see me live in person right there. There's George. Um, so anyway, let me move this over here. All right. Um, the agenda is broken down into four parts. First thing I'm going to talk to you guys about is what are robot competitions? Everyone has their own perception. A lot of people think it's battle bots. A lot of people think um, these are robots that are going to bash their you know, brains out with chainsaws and flamethrowers. Like It's not. Um, a lot of people think you're going up against another robot. You're actually going to be with another robot. You're going to be working together as a team to get points. And the, 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 the score that you get is the score the other robot on the field gets. So it's an interesting dynamic. I'll break that down for you. The fun part is the game reveal. I'm going to show you what this year's game is. I think it was part of your homework assignment to watch the video. So I'm going to explain to you what the game is, how it works, and break down the rules. If you guys have questions, uh, you know, you'll be able to ask. I'm going to talk about what you need to know for coaching a robotics team. And then the very last thing is, and it's weird to do over a webinar, I'm going to show you the robot kit, which will be mailed to your school. Um, Bree can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it will be mailed to your school. And uh, I made a video basically just for all of you of what to do when you get the robot. Like I, will, I open up the box and I show you every single part in the video so that you can examine it um, through, you know, when you get your stuff with me on YouTube, almost as if I'm in person. Um, first assignment. This is fun. I'm going to ask you all right now to go to Facebook right now. As I'm talking, I'm going to even, I'll literally open up my Facebook page right now. Hopefully there's nothing too obscene on it. Um, and I'm going to go to, oh, there's Tommy Wuzo. Bree will laugh at that um, from the room. Um, I'm going to click right in the search. I'm going to click on tech TPF 4Y. Oh, this is going really slow. It should pop up, but it's right here, TPF4Y Robots. Don't know why it's so slow. Um, right, there it is. So I'm going to go to Tech Point Foundation Freeze Robots. And what I want all of you to do as a homework assignment right now is I want you to follow our page. So click that you are following this page. And then if you scroll, I have to remember where this is. I believe it's in groups on the left side here. There's one called the Coach's Corner. And you want to go to, so like us, and we're not doing this to make more friends. We want to be your friend, but we're doing this because we put a lot of valuable information and grant opportunities and ways to make money and um, other news alerts on our Facebook page. And then Coach's Corner, click on this. Uh, I think it's going to ask you to request to join this. And I'm going to scroll down and show you. This is, hey, guys, need some uh, game set for Squared Away. Brand new in a box. Located. Please contact. Like, she's literally giving away Squared Away game or maybe selling it at a discounted rate. Like, there's people on here. These are all VEX, IQ, elementary and middle school coaches asking questions. So this is a great group for new coaches to ask what I say are stupid questions because there's no stupid question and there's a lot of a lot of um, experienced coaches in here answering questions. So um, great stuff in here for new coaches and experienced coaches. Uh, Bree created this little group. So please join Coaches Corner. Um, ask to join and we'll start accepting those. Look at this. I already see some of you. I'll accept Lisa, Pryor, Heather, look at this. We're just creating a great little group. There we go. So I accepted a few of you right now to join the group. So those are the two. And then uh, on, we're also on Twitter. If you want to follow on Twitter, we come across grants sometimes and we just need to give money away and we post them on there. So great way to, to find neat things. Um, I don't think this is going to 
apply to most of you, but if you did not get the homework assignment, that means you didn't get a link to this webinar, meaning you wouldn't be able to join right now. So it's kind of like, if you didn't do this, you wouldn't be here. But if you're not getting the webinar, the, the homework assignment that I keep referring to, I think it's literally titled homework assignment. I actually have it pulled up right here. It looks like this, confirmation and homework. If you did not get this email from us, which here's the link to the webinar, um, what you need to do, we sent it to you, I'm 99.9% .9 sure, you need to let your administrators know that robotgrantattechpointyouth.org is a safe email recipient and we'll be sending you emails throughout the school year and they need to unblock us. A lot of schools have been blocking outside organizations that are not within the school systems and they can end up in your spam. So um, we sent it to you. I'm confident we did. I'm 99.9% .9 confident that we did, just like hand sanitizer. All right, moving on. It's weird doing webinars I'm by myself in a room talking to, I think, 20 people, but I don't get to hear your reactions. So I'm going to be doing a lot of dad jokes to entertain myself. I do them anyway. Brief can attest to that. Um, all right, now we're going to dive into the meat of it all. So these are this is now we're diving into robots. No more like warm up. We're diving into the good stuff. So uh, there's three organizations. I'm going to start using my little pointer. There's three organizations. There's VEX. REC and TechPoint Foundation for Youth. It's important for you to know the three differences. Please ask questions if you don't understand. We, Bree and I, work for TechPoint Foundation for Youth. The analogy I use is like we're like the YMCA. REC is like the NBA. They make rules for the robot game and put on the competitions and you register your team with REC. Just like the NBA makes rules. VEX is like Wilson that sells basketballs, nets, and hoops. They make the equipment, they sell the equipment. So YMCA thinks basketball is great for kids. We think robots are great for kids. So we get them connected with NBA basketball, or in this case, REC Robotics, and we buy you VEX equipment, which are the VEX parts. So if you have a problem with your battery, you need to contact VEX. They will help you. If you have a problem with the rules or don't understand, you don't like the rules, that's REC. So I'm not passing the buck, but we sometimes get people that say, I don't like how the scoring works. And they get mad at Bree and I as if Bree and I made it. Or they say, um, I robot remote doesn't work after I dropped it 25 times. And I'll say, I'm really sorry about that but you'll need to talk to VEX about that. I think you're only allowed to drop it 21 times, not 22 times, something like that. Dumb joke again. But anyway, we are the nonprofit that helps connect you with robot parts and competitions. That's who we are. Any questions, go ahead and ask. Um, it doesn't let me advance when I'm on the pointer. So I'll go to a mouse. Randy Decker works for REC. This is an important email that you need to know. Um, Randy Decker is a regional support manager for all teams in Indiana. So if you ever have a question about REC, registering for a competition, registering for a team, you need to contact Randy Decker. Um, if you're having audio problems, Deb, uh, you could try calling in the phone number. Uh, I think that might be part of the invite. If not, I might be able to bring it up. Or Bree, you might be able to. I might be able to put it in the chat. I'm not sure. But I think you can call in with your phone because if you connect with your computer, it's based on your internet. So, um, next one, the schedule. Now, this is very important. Um, I'm going to put the in the chat. I think the phone number is in there right there. I just put it in there. So. Um, okay, so the calendar, I will, I'm going to be blunt and I don't want you to panic, but I would tell you, you are all at a disadvantage starting in October because I told most coaches they want to start thinking about and doing things in September. So don't panic and say, oh my gosh, it's the end of the world because I would tell you there are teams that start in November and December. So what I'm telling you right now is you need to get moving 
now with a lot of these things. And I used to be a little bit more lenient and tell coaches, you know what, you're, go you're a teacher. I don't want to interject on your life and not tell you what you need to do and what you don't need to do. And then I found out that caused too many problems. I need to be a little more blunt because this, I'm going to work backwards. Worlds is in April. State is in March. So your robot competition season is November, December, January, and February. Meaning you cannot carefully just wait. Oh, you know, winter break's actually kind of around the corner. Um, you know, I've got Thanksgiving break in November. December's kind of a wash. It's a short month. We have um, winter break. We come back in January. We'll start the season here. The problem with that thought is it's going to take you, and you can write this down, 10 weeks at a minimum to build your robot and be ready for a competition. Now, to build your robot, there's instructions. We'll go over it. It probably takes three to four meetings, but you'll need to modify that robot. You'll need to make it your own, unique, different. Try to play this year's game. In order to do that, you'll need... 10 weeks. So if you say, I'll start in January, well, there's four weeks here, there's four weeks here. You probably don't even have a full four weeks in January. Four weeks, four weeks, that's eight, and you're in March, and that's the start of your, you're done with your build season and state already starts. Competitions are done in February. That's not going to work. So you need to be starting now, and you need to be doing the things that I list over here. Start creating your calendar, which in my opinion starts by signing up for your first competition. And then for you, all of you on this call, you need to be starting your first competition in probably January and then working back 10 weeks to figure out where does that put you. And that's your last deadline uh, to, to start practicing, okay? Um, you need to assemble your team. You need to put together, and in my opinion, for you guys, I think your team should not be any larger than about six students. That might seem very small, but since you're at a disadvantage in October, by the time you guys get your robot parts, your kits, and we're going to ship those to you, by the time you get all that, the time you assemble your team before you, you start competing, you won't be able to manage more than about six. Eight's on the high end. I tell teachers six to eight students is the number that you want, but uh, for a first year team that's starting off late, six is your number. If you have 12, 15, 20 kids, you're gonna wanna start two, if not three teams. Um, it's just like a, a, a basketball team. You can only have five kids out there. You get 50 kids sign up for the basketball teams, you're gonna have to make cuts. You're gonna have to divide it up in a varsity JV freshman team. You're gonna need to divide it up somehow. So it is not uncommon for coaches to have more than one team. I've had coaches their first year do nine teams. That's insane. Uh, a joke I make, but I'm serious, is coaches, your first priority this year is survival. You need to survive your first year. And by overkill and having too many kids, um, you're not going to survive, and it's going to create more stress. I think you want to survive your first year, figure out how this all works, get to your first competition, and that's where the fun starts happening. Next year, you can start thinking about growing outside of six to eight kids. I have heard principals want to you know, dictate to say, no, you need to have 25 kids. Your response should be, well, we need about three to four more robots. They're $330 each. TechPoint bought one for us. And I'm gonna need about three or four extra coaches because that's gonna be three or four teams. So yeah, I'll have a team of 25, but I need more resources. And that's the amount of supplies, money, and support. Um, so six to eight, um, hope that doesn't freak any of you guys out. That's your ideal number. People ask me, how do we do it? We'll talk about it. How do you do it? You, you're gonna have to select, carefully select the students that you want on your team, the, maybe students that you have in your class. Okay, but anyway, build seasons here in October, November. You could maybe start out signing up for a competition in late December. If not, January, February are going to be when you're going to have your competitions. And then state is in March. It's at Lucas Oil Stadium in Indianapolis, which is a lot of fun. And then world championship is in April, the end of April in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, I used to say, like I said, I used to be loose about this. I'm tightening up, saying follow this calendar and you're already a month behind. Don't panic. We have a lot of people that start, I can't say a lot. Most people start in September but we have had people successfully start in October and even November. We've even had people start in December, which is scary and I don't like it, but it's happened. So 
Uh, if there's any questions, go ahead and ask uh, Bree below. All right. Um, overview in the chat. Okay, I see competition build. Can you mix EDR and IQ? No, just IQ. So just plastic robots. Uh, I'm going to ask you guys to respond in the chat very quick because we need to we need to go quick. How do, what do your students want to be when they grow up? What are the jobs that students want to be right now before they grow up? And I want to kind of think psychologically like why robotics is important and impactful before I start diving in how these competitions work. So type in the chat right now. YouTubers, that is very popular and a funny profession. Veterinarian, that's fun. I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian too. Engineers, ooh, smart. Game developers, engineer, doctors, nurses. Are there any football, basketball players? That's not cool anymore. Just video game designers and YouTubers and engineers. That's great. We have a great group. Um, all of those vet gamers, sports stars. Yes. Who do they want to grow up and be like? They say, I want to grow up to be, and what are the, the names of people? What are the famous names right now that people grow up and they say, I idolize, I want to be. I want to be Steph Curry. Famous YouTubers, we don't know. LeBron, unfortunately. I'm kidding. Um, what other names? Really quick. Steph, yep. Steph Curry. Ninja. Yep. You've seen him. So I'm going to show you guys six pictures. Shout out on the chat who these are. Ready? Who's this? First one gets a high five. Hey, the goat. I love it. Yes. Peyton Manning. Who's this? The goat again. We can have two goats. MJ, Jordan, <laughs> the cup. Who's this crybaby? LeBron. All right, those were easy. Who is this woman? No clue. Madame Curie. <laughs> Just, yeah, Marie. I'll even help you out with her name. Ada Lovelace. Does anyone know what she did? What is she famous for? Something with funny hair. <laughs> Something funny hair. Ada Lovelace is known as the first computer coder. She invented programming. And, and she's a woman. And I, and I say this because we talk about we need to get more girls and more women in STEM. And, and it's an unfortunate reality that if you go to some of the best universities, for example, Purdue, best university in the world, and you go in their CS classes, it still has less than about 20% of the students are girls. You go to the, some of the very progressive tech companies like Apple and Google, and they have 20% or less of the engineers and coders are female. And here we have the very first coder who none of us, and I'll admit, I had to look this up myself, none of us even knew who she was. We knew the first three, we didn't know her. Let's try another. Who are these two dudes? I don't know who they are either. I had to Google it. They're literally the guys that invented Google. And we didn't know who these guys are. Let me do another one. He's a little more popular right now. Who's this guy? Tesla. And he is not known for the car. He is known for the electric motor generator, AC current, remote control, all things that we use on a daily basis and we didn't know it. Why I do this and why I go over this is the first three are obvious. We see them in news, media, we have jerseys, we see they have apps and video games and there's just, they're fun. Football is fun to watch. Peyton Manning's fun to watch. Michael Jordan's fun to watch and reminisce and talk about how he's better than LeBron. Like that's all fun things. It is not fun to watch a coder or an engineer work, unless they're building something cool. But most of the work is, is design and calculations and coding, not really a fun, exciting thing. Why I say this is because robotics is fun. Competitions are exciting. So robot competitions have taken a play out of the sports playbook, pun intended, taken a play out of the sports playbook and applied it to engineering and to science and to coding. Because kids are going to build this robot. They're going to design it. They're going to think through things. They're going to fail. They're going to overcome failure. They're going to overcome problems and think critically. 
They're going to problem solve. All the things that all of you as educators help and want to do in your classrooms for students, that's what robotics does, and it celebrates it in a fun way just like sports. So I argue we have the, the Lucas Oil Stadium competition, uh, the state championship at Lucas Oil Stadium because these kids deserve something that big and spectacular that we do the same thing for football and soccer and marching band. All of the state high school big sports are at Lucas Oil Stadium or Bankers Life Fieldhouse. So the robotics state champion should be there as well. We're trying to elevate engineering and STEM to the same level as sports through robotics. So I'm trying to get you excited about robotics to, so that you worry, you worry less about the details of how do I build this robot? You don't need to know, your kids will. How do I program the robot? You don't need to know, your kids do. Like I'm trying to show you that you are providing resources for the students, they will figure it out, okay? You don't need to know how to do these things. So when we get to the very last, a lot of people think that this training is all gonna be about how the robots work. I don't know, I've never built my own robot. You don't need to know this. I always tell teachers, you throw a pile of Legos in front of a kid and say, build a car without any instructions, they'll figure it out. Now, some will, I don't have any instructions, I don't know how to do. Some will need a little nudge or a push, say, here's a picture of a car, make the Legos look like that picture. You might need to push them in the right direction, but you don't need to tell them, put that brick on top of that brick and build it piece by piece. You just need a little encouragement for the students, and that's why we need to do as coaches. I get a lot of questions say, what type of student have on my team? Well, let me tell you really quick. Do not have, in your position to try to get six kids, do not have a school-wide call out to say who wants to join the robotics team, because you're gonna have a really good thing happen, and that is you're gonna get every kid in your school wants to join the robotics team. That's an awesome thing. That's a great thing, and we hear that a lot saying, I have, I have too many kids that want to join my robotics team. Well, that means they love it and they're hungry for it, and your principal needs to identify that your school board needs to know it. Your, uh, your, your uh, superintendent needs to know that, that we need more robotics teams in, in schools. So that's a good thing, but it's not manageable for you to, to try to take on 150 kids. So carefully select which students um, should be on the robotics team. In my strong opinion, I think that those students um, should be on, anywhere on the spectrum. So I'm not gonna tell you what six to pick, but I want you to think about students that should be on both sides of the spectrum because I think robotics attracts students who love or hate school, get straight Fs or get straight As, struggle socially or talks all the time and have lots of friends, love sports or students who will never ever be in a sport. This is the type of student you should get is anywhere on the spectrum. Do not just look for students who love, love school, get straight A's, are fun and have lots of friends and are involved in a lot of sports. I want you to consider six students that hate school, get straight F's, have lots of fun and are in sports. Or love school, straight A's, doesn't have any friends and never be on, on, a, on a, a team ever in their life. Like you should have students diverse all over on this because robotics is gonna bring them together. They'll be a part of a team and the robot will be the end result. Uh, Bree, I see you on Slack. Is, this, is the audio getting that bad? I can move into the other room closer to the router. Um, so I don't know. I hear there's some audio issues and I apologize. I could also jump on my phone if needed, see if that helps. Way better now, cool. I don't know, I didn't do anything. Everyone has left the office, so maybe they're all off the bandwidth, or off the, okay. Um, I wonder if it has to do with when I pull up the websites and I try to show that. Anyway, we'll see when I do it again. All right, moving on. What do engineers do? So this is a question I think you should ask your students right in the beginning. Type in the chat, what do engineers do? This is my pulse check, so you guys are awake still. Solve problems. Oh, you guys are smart. Design. Solve problems. You guys all have the best answers. Design things on paper. Design new products. Yes, yes. They build things. They construct things. They, they re-engineer by taking apart and figuring out how things work. They blow up things. But you guys got it right out of the gate. They solve problems. Engineers solve problems. There's so many different types of engineers from mechanical to mechanical uh, to chemical to material engineers, electrical engineers, civil engineers, goes on and on and on. 
but it really comes down to engineers solve problems. And I think that is one of the most hireable skills right now in society in any field is if you know how to solve problems, you can get a job um, and you can be successful in your job. And so I think robotics teaches students how to overcome problems. Um, and we can all probably say, especially those that have been teaching for a long time, it just seems like students love to give up so much sooner. Let's not gossip on the chat right now. But it seems like kids love to just give up as soon as they run into a problem. They're like, I don't know how to do it, I give up. Robotics, you're going to notice when the students, they have to get ready for a competition, they're going to put that robot together. They're going to figure out how to get that robot to move for the competition. When the robot breaks at a competition and it falls apart, they're going to have to figure out how to put it back together before their next match. They're under stress. They, they're under uh, the minutes. The clock's ticking. They have to get it ready and going. They have to do it, not the coach. And that's going to all translate the first time they're facing a problem. They're like, oh, I've been here before. I've been in a stressful situation where my robot didn't work and I had to put it together really quick before a competition. I've been here. I know how to solve problems. It all translates to the real world. So I, that's what I love about it. Um, there's a little wheel that I made that I think is kind of cool. Uh, it's just that robotics is not just about building, programming, um, teamwork, and STEM mentors, which I think are all very valuable and obvious things. It's about collaboration, problem solving, critical thinking, real world problem solving and examples, and communication with team members. These are the things that I think are the skills that you need, or they call them the soft skills that you need for a job. These are the obvious things, like yes, programming is important, it's great, it's a nice skill to learn, but these are the qualities that I think you, that we sometimes struggle finding um, in our classroom, you know, activities that do these things. We're always looking for activities to do these, and I think robotics does all of them. So anyway, that's my nice little wheel of robotics. Um, this is more of a slide to just brag about Bree and I's hard work in the last three years. I, but it also is a compliment to all of the educators and teachers that have stood up to say, I want to be a robotics coach. Before Bree and I started this, there were 72 teams in Indiana, 58 of which were in Indianapolis because of Mayor Ballard, the mayor of Indianapolis, started a robot grant program to start robotics teams. And then he said to Tech Point Foundation for Youth, I want you to take this and go statewide. And that's where Bree and I came in three years ago to help start robotics teams. And in the last three years, we've gone from 72 to 1,536 teams. I mean, I can't even say the number. It's so big. They're everywhere. We have, and this is another bragging point about Indiana and awesome educators like you because you're adding to this. The number is going to be bigger this year. Is that we have more robotics teams than any other state in the country. More elementary and middle school VEX IQ robotics teams than any team or any state in the entire country, more than California, Texas, and Florida, which those are all states in the country. So um, I think that's a really nice thing. Um, all these blue dots, and this is something I'm going to show you. We can just see if the audio goes bad when I go on Facebook here or when I go on the Internet. So this will be our test. If you go back to our website, techpointyouth.org, this is something I think you guys should be aware of and where you can get help. And you go to robotics and robot map, and we just updated this today. If you scroll down, is my audio breaking up while I do this? Is it pretty clear? Um, I haven't gotten a response, so I'm worried that it's broken it up. <laughs> um, all these little blue dots, if you click on one, it shows what school has a robotics team. And all good. Thanks, Bree. Um, this is a way for you, if you're in rural Indiana, and we'll just pick on this school right. I'm trying to do this. There we go. Let's say you're in this rural Indiana up here in Knox. And you're like, all right, here's my school. What around? What is around me that has robotics teams? Right here. It looks like North Judson. Uh, right over here. Doesn't have a city name, but close to Union Mills, Knightsford Heights, Plymouth has a lot, uh, Wallerton, what is this? Winnem I, so you've got all these blue dots, maybe 30 minutes north, south, east, west of you. These are schools that you could ask questions to. I could put you in touch with these. Andy's job will help you put, touch, put you in touch with these people to help you, but also to help find volunteers to help support you. So this map is valuable. Um, take advantage of the robot map. We'll put emails out there um, saying, hey, if you want to be contacted with a school, check out the robot map. 
Here's another thing that's kind of cool. Uh, the first year, this is a problem we did not realize. You start so many teams, now you need so many competitions. Well, the first year, there were only seven competitions being held at schools. <laughs> so we had to grow that, and we actually were training teachers. Randy Decker did this um, from REC. We would train teachers, coaches, just like you, how to host a competition. So that might excite you. That might make you nervous as HE double hockey stick to do. Um, you don't want your first year, especially in October, to host a competition. So I'm telling you right now, it's out of question for you. But for next year, if you wanted to, you could host a competition at your own school in a gym or a cafeteria if you had a big space or your high school gym. Um, and the nice thing about it is there's a lot of benefits. One, it's in your backyard. Two, you're not going to drive far. Three, you're guaranteed to go to a competition because sometimes they fill up fast, so the one closest to you might not be available because it fills up. So you might have to travel 30, 40, 50 minutes away to get to a competition. Now it's in your backyard. And then the nice thing, the one that most people like, is that all the entry fees, so a competition is about 30 to $40. Let's say it's 30, I think it's 35 is the average this year for a competition. Each event's a little different, like 30 to 40, I think I saw one at 45. But if every competition is $30, everyone's paying an entry fee of $30, and 30 teams show up, that's $900 that goes to your team. So it's a fundraiser. So think that's three robot kits you could buy if you have 30 kids or 25 kids that sign up, you need money. You could host a competition, make $900 for just registration fees. So anyway, that's just something to think about. We had a lot of competitions. Last year, we had 123 competitions, which is enough for everyone to go to two competitions. Um, so... Um, it'll be your goal to, to your, it'll be required for you to go to one. It'll be a goal to try to get to two competitions this year if it's available um, and if there's one close enough for you and if you have the time. Two is, is the magic number. And I'll tell you really quick, it'll be up here later, but um, your first competition, you're going to be clueless. It's chaotic. It's a blur. It's like your wedding day. It's just like, boom, that was fun and fast and I don't remember anything. For your second wedding day, that's a joke. I don't know what a second wedding day is like. But the second competition you go to is, is, is you're like, I'm ready for competition now. Your kids understand what, what's expected. You understand how everything works. So try to get to two competitions if you can. All right, moving on. And the registration costs for those competitions are not part of the grant. So that's something that you guys will have to kind of figure out. Um, so it's a, you know, you're going to have to figure out funders. I have an entire YouTube video on how to fundraise for your team. Um, $40 fundraised across six students is less than $10 a person if you wanted to charge. Or I always say it is not unreasonable for a school principal or a school board to give a robotics team $40 to go to competition or $300 for a second robot kit for a second group of kids. I mean, $300 out of a, a budget, and I don't care how, I, I don't want to get into this discussion right now, but I could talk to you on the phone about, I don't care how poor your school is, there is money for your robotics team somewhere, and I can help you get it if you need help. So let me know. Cost should never be the barrier. Um, someone brought up, is EDR or VRC part of the competition? These are the metal robots. I just showed the slide to show you it is not. It, you will all only compete with plastic robots. So your metal robots will not be there, um, won't be at your competitions, but you might see it at a competition. Some competitions have blended. They have, uh, like in the gym is uh, the plastic robots and the in the cafeteria is metal robots, but you will never compete with a metal robot. You'll be all plastic. All right, now we get into the fun stuff. We're on to the game now. So robot game. Um, every year there is a new robot game. Uh, I don't remember, but I think Bree asked you guys to watch the video. Say, I did. How many of you watched the video for this year's game? I just want to see if you guys did that because I think you did. Yes, perfect. Richard did. All right. I did. Awesome. I watched videos. I did. Awesome. You guys are rock stars. So there's a video every year that kind of does an overview. I'm going to break down that video and go over the rules. Now's your time to ask me any question about the game on how it works. This is just to show you that every year there is a new game. If you notice this white perimeter with the black checker boxes over it, that field is an eight foot by four foot field. It's the same field every single year. What changes are the game pieces inside of the field. So Bree and I did a really nice thing. Not only did we buy you a robot kit, but we bought you the white and black field, which will also be shipped to your school, 
What we did not buy you are the game pieces that go inside. Those are $100. So now I'm just adding up things for you. Game pieces, $100. Registration fee of $40. You're at $140 right now. Now we have bought you over $600 worth of equipment to get you started. That's usually the biggest hurdle and barrier. But just to be completely transparent, why we don't buy you everything, and this is, we can have a discussion with you individually if you don't like this, but I think that every school needs to have a little skin in the game because if you don't and we buy you everything, it's kind of that entitled, privileged, we got it all and if we don't like it, we can walk away and we didn't lose anything. I think you put $100 in the game, you're like, it's a little, your principal is less likely to walk away from it and I care about sustainability and opportunity for your kids. That's my number one priority is to get these opportunities for this, the kids. Um, the cost uh, the, the, that is put on by the schools, I am more than happy. My phone number was already you know, shared with all of you. I'm more than happy to jump on a phone call and talk to you guys about how to fundraise money at $140 uh, for your team. Not to brag, just putting in things in perspective. I was a first year, 22 year old high school robotics coach that had to raise $60,000 every single year for my robotics team. This is high school. The robots were the size of washing machines and a competition cost me $5,000. We went to four competitions. We went to two competitions, state and worlds. So um, now I'm not bragging. I'm just putting things in perspective. I have no idea as a 22 year old how to raise money for a team. And I figured it out I, and, and I can help you with that. So $140 does not intimidate me at all for any school in any community in anywhere. We can figure this out together. I can help you. But I think it starts with your principal, your parents can help contribute, um, principal, and then school board superintendent, and then outside companies. I can help you with all that. I have videos on that. We're not going to talk about that right now. But anyway, um, while I'm talking about the field, let me just show you where you get the field, then we'll break down the game. Um, and I shouldn't say field, I should say game piece. If you want to follow along with me, so if you go to Vex Robotics and you go to their website, you know, click right here at the top. It says VEX IQ and EDR. I think someone, gentleman brought up EDR. And then we're going to do IQ. That's the plastic robots. And then you're going to go to competition. I'm lying. You're going to go to products and competition products. And I'm just going to show you what we bought you and what you'll still need to buy. So this is what you'll still need to buy. I don't like this photo. That's why I'm going to click on it and show you. <laughs> it looks like it comes with everything in this photo. Oh, I thought it was better. It's an awful photo. Let me show you this way. Sorry. Back up. This is what we bought you, which is the field with that's the eight foot by four foot perimeter. They call this the perimeter and tiles. This is what we bought you. The field perimeter and tiles. What you'll need to buy are the game pieces. I think I went back too far. You'll need to buy the game pieces, which in this photo shows the game pieces and the field and perimeter. And so it's very confusing. I could have sworn there used to be. I thought there was a photo that just showed this. It's just the game pieces, the squares. So this is what you want to buy are the squares, the balls. It's, it's $99.98. So that's what you want to buy. It's in stock. This is what you want to buy. Anyway, let me go back to the game. So these are old years games. This is this year's game. There's, there's, and th let me go over this and then ask questions as I go. Number one, there are four ways to score points. Putting a ball inside of any of the cubes is one. Putting a ball on top of the cubes is two. Putting the same colored cube in the same colored corner is 10. And then putting a green cube stacked on top of, and there's three different platforms, is 20. So 1, 2, 10, and 20. Now let's look at the field. And I just want to show you some things. So these orange balls are what you can put inside any of these cubes. Doesn't matter, green, red, or blue. Any orange ball can go inside any cube, and those are worth one point. 
the red cubes over here are on the opposite corner of the field. That's the challenge. That's why they call this a robot challenge. It's called the squared away of XIQ robotics challenge. It's not easy. It's challenging to get this red cube over here. And then the blue one's on the opposite, blue over here. Now, they did make one thing easy, but it's still not that easy, is they put the green right in line with the towers, and you start right in front of it. So if you were skillful to be able to pick this up, you could stack it right in front, on top. Now, some things that I did not notice that is hard to see in this picture and in this video, and I'll tell you, um, if you read the manual instructions carefully and you look at the video carefully, you'll see these things. Number one, going back to, if you look here, this cube I'll say is upside down because the cross pattern is down, and this cube is right side up because the cross pattern is up. So if you look at the difference, and you can see this is down. This one looks like it's down. The field starts in this configuration with the cross pattern on, all, on the greens down. And the red and blue are up. So that's just something to keep track on. If your strategy is to pick up balls and stack them on top, you're going to have to flip over the green. Um, another thing that I did not notice that's hard to see, and it's even hard to see in this picture, but you can see in the video, is these two platforms here and here are wider and lower than this platform here, which is smaller, narrower, and taller. So if your strategy was to, I'm going to pick up this, and let's say this was eight inches off the ground. I'm going to pick this up eight inches off the ground and stack it. Well, this might be, and I don't know these numbers. I'm going to make it up. Let's say this is 10 or 11 inches off the ground. Well, if it only raises up eight for this, it won't be tall enough for this. So that's just something to think about. Um, so you have one minute to score as many points as you want, as you can. Um, there are three different ways to play and we'll break it down. There's the teamwork challenge where there's two robots on the field. There's skills challenge robot driving where you're one robots driving with the, the remote control. And then there's robot skills programming challenge. So skills programming challenge with one robot, your robot driving autonomously all by itself without a remote control. And so we'll break down each three of those games. But all three games use the exact same rules. All of you will, at a competition, play eight rounds of a teamwork challenge. So you get eight tries with another random robot. You don't know who the random person is until the day of the event. It might be another team from Kokomo, another team from Evansville, another team from Indy, another team down the street. But you'll be with another team. I'll tell you, this team, let's say we're over here on the left, this team is either going to be really good or it's going to be really bad. Most of the time, for you all on this call, you're going to be the team that is not good. Okay, all of you will, I'll just say it, you'll suck your first competition. So you're going to be the robot that sucks and not score a lot of points. But in this game, you, I say, you can drive around like a madman in circles and do donuts and score points. You can literally just swing this blue cube into that corner by just dragging it or bumping it across the, the field and you get 10 points. You could probably accidentally knock balls into these cubes and get points. So anyone, no matter their skill, can still score points. The challenge is to score more points than the other teams. But again, in a teamwork challenge, you're getting the same amount of points um, with your partner. Now, some details I want to show you. Um, Th these are pretty obvious, but this is scored. That's one point. This is scored because it's breaking the plane. That's one point. And you can put as many balls inside of here as you can stack. So that's two points. This is not scored because it's not even inside the cube or breaking the plane. So that's just silly. But, and let me just show you the manual, which has a lot other examples. And I'll show you where you can find the manual. You can go to Vex Robotics. Squared Away is the name of the game. And I'm gonna that's not it. I'm gonna scroll down and it says 2019-20 Vex IQ Challenge Competition. This is where the game page is, goes over all the rules. That video you should have watched for your homework. And if you didn't, here's the video, here's the game manual. Um, here's some other information, not really that important. 
Um, but I think it's like a 30 page document, 29 page document. And I'm just gonna scroll and highlight just a few things. Uh, there's the, there's the, the uh, field I showed you on that PowerPoint slide. Again, your kids need to know these things, not you. Okay, the, the, the rules are up to your kids. This is the, the red area, and I would tell you, I'll zoom in here, see if it works. Yeah, look at that, zoom in. The red area is defined by this black edge line right here. Okay, so that is the black line. It needs to just, it just needs to break it. So I can even draw on here, look how awesome this is gonna be. I haven't got to draw yet. Let's see how this works. If you had a cube like that, that would count. Like if it, here I'm gonna make it, I don't know if I'm gonna make it 3D. Oh no, this is turning out horribly wrong. All right, we're gonna, I don't know. I don't know if you can see the 3D part. Oh no, I made it a little crooked. That's actually not too, I mean, come on guys, it's not too bad. So let's say it's breaking the, the corner here. Um, that, that is, that is count, uh, counts for points. That's 10 points there. All right, let me clear my trash. Let me go ahead and ask questions. Let, let me see if there's any other questions. I'm gonna go through a couple more of these um, on the, the manual. Let me zoom out. Here's a, a very common question I get is student age. So if you scroll down here, it is going to say, Uh, well, I'm, I'm skipping some things. Uh, it, it's under student, and it's all alphabetical. Um, they're just showing, yep, that, that counts. I don't know how you balance, balance a ball there, but that counts. Balls here, that counts. All of those, that's that's two, four, six, eight tanks. Remember, these are each worth two points, so that counts. That counts. That's barely in. That counts. This one is hard to tell, but this does not count because if I zoomed in there, that, I don't know how you would get into this, but it is, you can't even see from this photo, but it is not inside the black line as outlined, and it's not touching that zone. It has to be touching that square in there, not hovering over, okay? That's gonna be hard to happen, but no. You can kind of see in here, and I guess you can't. This is the, the tall, skinnier one. I don't know if they have an example this short. Shorter one. All right, here, this is really important. I need to run to the restroom. <laughs> so I'm gonna let you guys read what this says about student and ask questions if Bree has any questions or is she gonna help you with the student. I'm gonna run to the restroom. I'm sorry, it's five o'clock. I only have about a one hour bladder. And then and I'm gonna run back. So read what it says about student and then come with questions. Coming back. All right, perfect. Oh, I'm glad, Jason. I'm not the only one. Bree, I'm definitely getting old that I cannot last an hour without going to the restroom. I used to be able to do these two-hour presentations without taking a potty break, but not anymore. All right. Um, On the page where George showed us what we still need to buy, it says full field and pieces are $9.99. Is that correct? Um, full pieces. Yes, there's referees to help you. Okay. I'm going to go to that. I'm not sure. I see some questions. I'm going to let Bree just slack me if there's any questions I need to address. I think that's what you're doing anyway. So I'm going to move on. Um, if there are any questions about student age, all I mean, when you break it down, uh, 
Let me, all right, I think there's questions about the field, and let me go back to Vex Robotics website. I think there's a lot of questions about what to buy. I'll just, I'll tell you, I'll make it very easy for you. Go back to Vex. I'm gonna go to IQ. And I, I completely agree, it is, I've been working with these guys for three years and I know they don't make it very clear. So don't feel bad. What you wanna buy is this right here, but there's different things in here and they have, you can basically buy this on this page. So, so when you look down here, it says Vex IQ squared away full field and game element kit. And then it says Vex IQ full field perimeter and tiles. We're buying you this with your grant. You're getting this. What you want is what's checkboxed when you go to this page right here. And oh, you know what? Here, this is the what I wanted to show you. This might be an easier explanation. This is what you need to buy. I don't know why they do this. This is so goofy. Essentially, the balls are $24, the cubes are $74, and they package it all up in this $998 squared away full field and game element kit. That's what you want to buy. The field, which is the white thing, we're sending that to you. So, I'm going to put it in the Slack. That is what you want to buy. It's what's checkmarked. Do not get the field perimeter. You're already getting one. You're just getting that. Um, hopefully, I made that as clear as possible. Another thing I'll tell you for any principal that says, well, that's a lot of money, $100. That's like, oh, this shows you the three different levels too short, tall, short. A um, couple arguments too. Spending $100. Yeah, that's like playing basketball without a hoop. Yeah, you could practice drills and passing, you could practice driving your robot, but you cannot actually practice scoring baskets into a hoop without the hoop. You need the pieces to practice. And the other thing, all of these pieces are Vex IQ parts that you can use next year. So it's almost like an investment. After you're done, you can use them for next year, and then you're like, what about the balls? The balls are great little trophies. You can put signatures, say 2019-20 school year, and then now is there are little trophies at the end of the school year that you hand out to your students. You do not need two, you do not need to do two fields. The only time you'd ever need two fields, in my opinion, is if you had five or more teams. I think three, four teams could borrow one field at the same exact time. One field is fine. Don't if you got the money, go for it. I don't I mean if you got the money, I say if you guys have money or swimming in it, better better take that before that money's gone. <laughs> so buy two fields, buy ten robots, um, sign up for ten competitions and give yourself a nice little sign on $10,000 bonus or something. And uh, hire your husband or wife as an assistant coach and they get $10,000. We're just dreaming now. All right, I gotta get back to reality. Um, all right, so now I wanna show you what a competition actually looks like. Uh, in the chat, really quick, who, has anyone ever been to a competition? No, 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 let me ask it this way. Has anyone never been to a competition? You've never been to a robot competition? Say it in the chat. No, never been, never. All right, that's what I am expecting, okay? Um, I will tell you, as a spectator, it is so much fun to watch and see your comp the competition work. As a first year coach taking your first year team to your first competition, I'm just gonna be blunt, it is overwhelming. It is kind of intimidating because there's so much going on at once. I'm gonna break it down for you to explain it to you. But until you go through it, it is it is very difficult your first time. That's usually why every single coach is, tells me, tell new coaches to go to more than one competition. The most common advice that returning coaches tell me is tell new coaches, go to one more competition because the first one will be a, a kind of overwhelming. And I've got a, a graph that I show called my stress graph. It's coming up here in a couple slides. That's going to show you your most amount of stress is going to be at your competition. At the end of that competition, you're going to wish you had time for a second competition. And your kids are going to be like, when's our next event? And you need to go into this knowing that you will suck. 
you're going to get last place. And I'm saying this because you need to set the expectations. Some of you are, are competitive. Bree is number two in our office in fantasy football and was bragging when she was number one. She's competitive. Some of you maybe are competitive. I, I'm just slanting at Bree because she's muted and she can't defend herself right now. Um, you know, some of you guys are competitive. I love that you're competitive, but you cannot go into these competitions saying, we're going to win. We're going to get first place. We're going to state our first year. Some teams do go to state their first year, but that should not be your goal. Your goal is survival. Get to your first event, see how it works, get your comp your kids to the competition, have fun. And then the second competition you can worry about, you know, our high score was 10 at our first competition. Our second competition, hopefully we get 15. Like you just need to make baby steps in progress. All right, here's the layout of how it works. So if you look on this overview, Bree, I added some photos before this uh, meeting. So, oh, someone's, I need to mute someone. Bree, can you mute someone? Um, on the competition layout, the way it works is usually it's a gym or a cafeteria, and uh, it, so it might be in it might be in multiple rooms. It might be in one big room. So in this example, on the right side, this is one gym over here, and what you can't see on the right side are uh, the pit areas. And if you can look over here, this is the gym with the fields and the the pit areas over here. So if you look at this, this is kind of a mirror image of what you see over here, is that this is the audience in a gymnasium environment. They sit and watch. Sometimes you'll have one, two. In the picture over here, you've got four fields. So there's a variety of number of fields. And then you have these pit areas. This is like their home base. So when you get to the competition, you're going to be assigned a pit area. This is going to be a table. It might have an extension cord where you can charge batteries. Um, your kids can put your robot down here, any extra parts you bring, a laptop if you're going to program your robot, all the jackets because it's going to be wintertime, snacks or lunches if they allow it at the competition. This is your home base. And then when you compete, your kiddos are going to walk the robot over here. And again, it's two drivers. You as a coach can walk the kids up here, but they do not. You as a coach do not go there with the kids. It's just two kids driving um, with the other two kids that are an alliance partner, and you will spectate with the rest of your team from the audience. You cheer, you break, yeah, good job, you cheer, and then you meet your kiddos after that match back at the pit area. You high five them, hey, great job, you got four points, that's awesome. Last year or last uh, uh, week at practice, we only got three points, we got four, awesome, way to go. Let's let's see if we can get four again or maybe five. So positive encouragement. I always tell coaches the attitude you present at a competition will, will rub off to the kids. You're stressed, freaking out, complaining about sucking. Your kids are going to be stressed, freaked out, and complaining about sucking. If you cheer and celebrate four points, your kids are going to be like, oh, everyone else is getting 50, but my coach is really excited about four. They're going to look at your face and expression. So go into it, as I said, knowing that you're going to get last place, knowing that you won't get as many points as your practice because at a competition there's more pressure. Just have low expectations and celebrate any kind of success you can for your students to make sure that they feel like they have done and accomplished something. Because think about it, you're going to start off with a bunch of parts that kids put together and scored points with. I mean, just think about that concept that kids are going to design a robot and then compete in front of an audience that's cheering them on. Like, where else can we celebrate engineering and creativity like that? It's just, I'm almost like, Tearing up, I'm so excited about it. It is just such a spectacular time, so make sure you celebrate at these competitions. Um, why I liked these two competitions is things are nice and orderly at the very beginning of the event when everyone is like ready, like you can see all the kids are sitting there, the, the uh, event partner is talking about what to expect, and then once the match starts, I don't wanna say it's chaos, but it is, everyone is everywhere, and if you have two or three teams because you have more kids, you're going to have a kid on this field, a team on this field, a team in the pits, a team in the, it is, it becomes chaos very quick. That's why it takes more than one competition to figure out the flow of everything, okay? So that's the layout. Let me show you how the competition part works with uh, matches. So we're going to talk about teamwork challenge, then we'll go into skills. You're going to get a match list. It's going to look something like this but it'll be more spaced out. We're gonna pretend that we are team 22222D. So I tell coaches, highlight all of your matches. 
So in this example, we have one, two, three, four, five. It might be multiple pages. Ignore the times because usually you have 20, 30, 40 minutes in between matches. Um, if you notice, team two is a different team. We don't know who this team is until we go walk over and meet them. Here's a different team. Here's a different team. We're going to be paired with different teams every match. Coaches ask, should we walk over and meet these teams before we compete? Yes. I would advise you walk to the pits and track down this first team you're with and say, hi, we're in the first match together. Let's talk about a strategy. What do you guys do? Oh, uh, well, we're a new team. We can only push cubes. This is your kids talking to their kids, not coach or adults involved in this conversation. They just say, hey, we we're, we're just push robot uh, or our robot just pushed the squares into the corner or the cubes in the corner. They're like, oh, great. We stack the green ones. Like, oh, we can't do the green ones. Oh, great. We'll do the red and blue. You do the green. And that's how we'll collaborate and work together. Well, that's the strategy for just match three. Our next match, which looks like match five, we'll have a different strategy. They're going to say, we push cubes, and you're going to say, we push cubes. You're like, how about we do red, you do blue. I love red. I love blue. Great. And that works out. So you just come up with strategies for each match. Think about the dynamics of you have students from, we'll just say, Gary, Indiana, communicating with students from Evansville, Indiana, before competition. These are two different groups of students that may never ever meet one another in any parts of life, and here they're now communicating and working together as a team on the fly. Talking about the, the communication that kids have to learn how to work with different types of students from different communities is just, it's wonderful. Then you go to Worlds, and, and you're talking with kids from different countries with not even speaking uh, the same language as you. It's just a wonderful, I mean, we have a, we have a blind and, and a deaf team in, in Bex. So, I mean, just think about the diversity of the kids get to collaborate and work together with. Uh, it's just terrific. So, you highlight all of the, um, uh, the matches you go to, and you'll have up to eight, and you, uh, the, they throw away your two lowest scores. So, you can tell your kids after a bad match, oh, they're going to throw that score away. You can only tell them that two times, though, because they, they throw away your two lowest scores every four, or one, ugh, I think I'm getting tired. They throw away your lowest score every four matches. You'll get eight matches, so that means so they'll throw away two of your lowest scores. You can only tell your kids they'll throw away the lowest score two times. So if they suck three times, one of those suck scores are going to have to count. There, I got it all out. Um, all right, highlight your matches, go in there, and then in between, when you, you notice on the schedule, there's a big gap here. So you tell your kids, after match 10, let's go to skills. So this might be your, right here, this is me writing with a mouse. This is my skills time. So now you might be wondering, what is skills? Well, let me show you. That's a great question. Talking to myself, asking and answering questions. Uh, types of challenges. There's a team or challenge, which I just described. You with another team scoring as many points as you can. If you get 20, they get 20. You got a score of 20. You get 150, they got 150. You got a score of 150. They don't add up. It's just a total score at the end of the match where the cubes and balls lie at the end of the match. Now, here's the skills challenge. This eliminates that second robot. So why this is helpful is this is an opportunity for you to see how good you are compared to other teams without another outside influence. Because that other team might be good, that other robot might be bad. But when you do skills, it is all you by yourself. And you can't blame someone else. So the way the robot skills work is you driving the robot by yourself. It's two kids, two of your drivers, um, driving, playing the same game, scoring the same amount of points. People ask, should we use the same driver every time? I tell you, for your first competition, for your first team, have anyone that wants to drive, drive. And then your second competition, if you want to start caring about being competitive, you want to have the you want to have consistent drivers. You don't want to have the same driver every time because um, you want students that have practice over and over and over and over. Think about Steph Curry. They give it him because he practices three all the time. So if it's a clutch moment and they need three points, they give it to clutch, they give it to Steph Curry to get those three points. So if you know a kid that's going to be driving over and over and over again, they are going to be the ones that be best at drivers. 
So if you have a team of six, you're going to have some kids that will be drivers, some kids that will be builders, some kids that will be programmers, some people will be in charge of um, resetting the field. I mean, so anyway, I'm going off on a tangent. Sorry. Robot skills is just the robot driver, um, um, two students on your team, one robot, score as many points as you get. And then skills is the same exact thing, but you don't touch the remote. It's all pre-programmed. And the software is free. There's videos on how to do the software. It's legit drag and drop. And what I mean by drag and drop, I'm going to do a screenshot of Vex IQ code blocks. Uh, if any of you have done scratch, which is the little cat code blocking, let me just show you really quick. Here's an image of VexIQ code blocks. Um, there's options. There's ModKit. There's RobotC. There's VexIQ code blocks. This is the new one um, that everyone's using now. It is. It's hard to see, but what this code says is drive forward, turn right for 90 degrees, and then I don't know what this is. Oh, like turn a light green. So that thing's gonna drive forward, turn 90 degrees, and then a light's gonna turn green. It's literally just dragging commands, putting them underneath, and then see what happens. It's a lot of trial and error. So it's a great way to kid, get kids not only to code, but to actually code a robot and see it do something physical, which is really cool. All right. I think I rambled very quickly over all of this. Ask questions. Bree, are there any questions that they've asked? Is there any questions about robot skills? Oh, I, here's something. I While you guys are writing those questions, here's something I did not explain. The way skills works... Um, let me do scoring. So I'll do it with writing up here. For skills challenge, you're going to have eight matches. So let's say the first match you got 10. The next match you got 20. Next match you got 5. Next match you got 12. Next match you got 50. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Next match you got 1. Next match you got uh, 3. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And then the last match we got, I don't know. 13. They throw away your two lowest scores. So it looks like this is a low score and this is a low score. You add up all those numbers and that is your total score for Teamwork Challenge. So I'm going to add these up. Let me just say it's 130. You have 130 points and that is your match for Teamwork Challenge. Here's how Robot Skills works. You get three tries at Robot Skills. You get three tries at Programming Skills. So let's say you got 5, 10, and three. This is the score they go with, the highest score of the three. Program challenge, let's say you got one, two, and five. All right, you got five. This plus sign here is 10 plus five. Your robot skills score is 15. It's 10 here plus five here. I think that's a five or is that a three? I don't remember what I said. I think I said that's a five. Sorry, my handwriting is so hard with the mouse. 15, that's my skill score. Is it a good idea to have a few extra kiddos in case someone can't go or get sick? Uh, I would take your whole team to the competition regardless of drivers. Everyone should be going to the competition, not just the drivers. Um, any other questions, Bree, that I need to answer? Uh, Two drivers, uh, so first 30 seconds is driver one, second 30 seconds is driver two. So what I say is think about what are you going to do in the first 30 seconds. We're going to put the cubes in the corners. Great. What are you going to do the second second? Uh, second 30 seconds. You're going to put the balls in the cubes. Great. So driver one, cubes in the corner. Driver two, balls in the cubes. So they should have kind of an outline. What do you do in the first 30? What do you do in the second driver? Uh, do, what does the second driver do in the second 30? Some teams break it down. Every five seconds, they know what needs to happen, or every 10 seconds, what needs to happen. Real good teams break it down to every second they know what's going to happen. So it's kind of like you have an opener and a closer. Um, other questions? Every round, regardless, is one minute. Team or challenge, skills, all of them in one minute. Any other questions? Thanks, Bree. Bree, post a picture of Juliet. I don't know how you do that. She is awesome. She makes me look very good. Um, all right. Moving on. This is just a picture to show the difference between two is you've got teamwork challenge over here, which is 
a team here in the black and a team here in the gray. This is their one robot. You can't see the second robots behind this picture, but there's two robots there. This is teamwork challenge. That's what it'll look like. And then this is skills challenge. And you can see there's no robot. So this is skills challenge programming. Because are there no, um, sorry, there's no remote control. You can see it looks like his hands and his hoodies. Hopefully he's not cheating with the remote in that hoodie right there. I never noticed that. That's kind of funny. Um, so this is a skills challenge. It's one robot on the field and they're not driving. So this is a programming skills challenge. Um, team challenge everyone will do. I encourage everyone to do skills challenge. This is more stressful because there's an audience of people watching. Skills is usually off to the side and you can see there's just fields and there's people don't like coaches. Uh, there's no bleachers or audience really for this because it's kind of a, at your own time you go to there. Um, I already kind of went over this, but I'll go over it very quick. Let's say we're team one. We got 20 points with team two. Our total score is 20 points. Next rep, we're team one. We're with team three now. We got 30 points. And our overall ranking, we have 50 points. Oh, looks like we're in first place. Yay. That's how the scoring works. You'll do that eight times. Um, on uh, Heather, every team gets three tries at programming and three tries at driving. So that's six total tries you can do. And I want to outline what I mean about skills. Not every competition you go to is going to have the same agenda. So it's careful. Make sure you take careful look at the agenda and look at when skills is. So I did this on purpose intentionally. Most comp All competitions are on Saturdays. So I apologize if that's an inconvenient time. Saturdays from 8 to 3.30 is a typical time. This is what happens. From 8 to 9.30, you'll do check-in. You will get, register that I'm here. Once everyone's checked in, they'll print the match schedule. If they wait until everyone's there because if someone doesn't show up, they have to remove them from the match schedule so you don't show up with someone not there. And then um, from at 10 o'clock, they usually have an opening ceremony. That's what I showed in that picture of everyone sitting and listening. And it's a driver meeting, kind of going over the rules, the layout, where pits are, where the restrooms are, where concession stands are. Matches start, and in this example, skills matches are going on at the exact same time. And then lunch, usually they break from 12 to 1, but if you notice in this example, skills is only from 10.30 to noon, meaning you only have an hour and a half to do your skills matches. I'll tell you this, it's not ideal, but it's just life, and life's not always fair. Not everyone is going to have time to do all six of their skills matches. In an ideal world, everyone will. Honestly, I don't want to say that it happened. It's not, I don't know how to say this properly, but if you want to get six matches, the chances of you getting six matches are very likely. Why doesn't it happen always? Is because some people aren't looking at the agenda and noticing it's only an hour and a half open or they chose to eat food instead of robots, and robots are always more important than food. So, you know, sometimes they're like, oh, I ate, we ate, went to lunch early, and we ate 11.30 instead of skills. Um, can every member do skills? Yes, anyone can do skills. Yep, anyone can drive, as long as they're on your team. All right. Um, I don't think this video is going to play. Um, and I don't think it's going to play in front of all of you, but I want you to watch this video at some point and I'm going to highlight it and I'm going to just commentate um, a, a couple points. This, this is what I want every, I want every Indiana team to strive for. And this is me as the vice president of, of STEM education for Tech Point Foundation for Youth is telling you from my mouth that I do not care if you score a lot of points or get a lot of trophies at your competitions. And if we compared ourselves with other states of the world, I do not care if we're the lowest scoring robots in the country. What I care about is that students know how to problem solve, think critically, and they're very gracious and professional to one another and they respect one another. That is what I care about. So when we go to Worlds, people ask, oh, how did Indiana do? How, did, how many points did we score? How, what was our ranking? I don't usually care or even know or pay attention to that. What I look at are small little subtle details. And Bree and I had the privilege of, of going to Worlds this year, and we got to watch this final match of a second year group of students that made it to the final comp final round. They're from, um, uh, why can't I, uh, Amish Shakers, what the heck is it? Plymouth, no. Where is Jake Simons from? 
Wakarusa, Plymouth. Wood, anyway, Woodview, Napanee, thank you. Napanee um, from Woodview Elementary, they have a red team and a blue team. They um, have a wonderful robotics team. The coaches, and he, he, Jake is just so, such a wonderful guy, helpful um, to all their coaches, and has really prepared these kids for success. They have, um, um, we have 350 elementary teams at the World Championship. 350 teams were at the World Championship. Um, I think 80 of them were from Indiana. And in the finals, 12 teams at six alliances, because there's two teams on alliance, 12 teams made it to the finals. If you looked at those 12 teams, it was team from China, 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 team from China. 11th team from Napanee, Indiana. 12th team, Napanee, Indiana. His two teams both went to the World Championship final stage. And the blue team was the better team and paired up with a Chinese team. And they're playing and getting a lot of points. So you can see they're supposed to stack these cubes into the corner. And I'm not playing it, I'm just gonna fast forward. They're stacking these uh, hubs in the corners, hubs in the corner. They're getting all these hubs in the corner. And then there's a bonus hub right here. And it's hard to see in slow motion like this, but what right here, and you can see it on her face. This Chinese team knocked over this bonus hub and it fell down instead of picking it up. And it fell down in their area. And they're gonna drive over here and bump them to get it and it knocked over this tower. And they've gone from, I'm gonna win the world championship in, out of 350 teams to I just lost the competition because our alliance partner, the Chinese team, made a very critical mistake. And here is what I like. I'm going to fast forward right there. The very last, right after the competition, when they notice that they've got hubs on the floor, they didn't get the bonus stack, this girl reaches over and high fives both of the alliance partners. First thing she does, she doesn't throw a fit, she doesn't complain, she doesn't cry. I mean, this is a Middle, elementary, middle school. I forget, dang it, I'm so bad with my info here. This is, I think, an elementary student. Yeah, this is a fourth grader. Elementary student who, in front of thousands of people, lost the world championship and she did not cry. She didn't throw a fit. She graciously, I call it the high five her around the world. High five the two people. And that is what I think Indiana Rose is about. That is what I'm what I strive and I hope every team um, um, cares about, not how many points they got on the board. All right, that's done. That's my lecture. I don't mean it to sound luxury. It's just something I'm very proud of in Indiana teams, and I hope that all of us as coaches strive for that type of team. Um, general rules I've already gone over. One minute match, two drivers, rotate controller at 30 seconds. Uh, robot rules, I've got just quick. You're gonna get four motors in your kit. You can use up to six. The very first year, we bought two extra motors for every single team, and out of the 330 uh, robots kits that we bought, not a single one used a fifth or sixth motor, so we don't buy them for you anymore. They're $20 if you want to buy them. You don't need them. Unless you're swimming in money, you don't need extra motors. This is important. Everyone listen up. Wake up. Make sure you're listening. This is very important. Your robot cannot be longer than 19 inches or wider than 11 at any time during the match, and it can never be any taller than 15 inches. So if your robot has an arm that swings, from that point to that point, it can never be longer than 19 inches. If it's wide, it can never be wider than 11, and it can never be taller than 15. There is a robot, and I'll say this so I don't forget, and we need to be done in 32 minutes. There is a robot that is going to have instructions called ClutchBot that you can build, you can have your students build, and, all, and, and it can sort of play this year's game, but I've been told it reaches taller than 15 inches. So it's almost ready to play this year's game, but your kids will have to make modifications to make sure that it never goes over 15 inches because that would be illegal. So um, size rule, I always tell Coaches need to make sure that the kiddos are measuring all the time, anytime they make adjustments or changes to the robot. Now, the good news is when you go to competition, you get inspected and they go, uh-oh, you're 19 and a quarter inches 
long, they're not going to give it to you. You got to shorten your robot by a quarter of an inch. That's the good news is you can change it. They don't kick you out or disqualify you. The bad news is you just spent 10 weeks building a robot and an hour before your competition, you now have to make a modification. So you now have to shorten your robot by a quarter of an inch. This design might be easy. We just shorten this little doohickey tail here. This might be hard because we're already built to the edge here and the, we have an arm here. We got to make our arm shorter and maybe it was intended to be that long to get on top of the green. So just be careful with the size rule. Most common mistake is teams build it the wrong size. Uh, and let me pull over the manual because I went over that and then I think I took a potty break and I didn't go back to it. All of the rules that your kids need, not you, all your kids need are in this manual, 29 pages. I used to have a kid called the Info Junkie that knew all of the rules. And we had a question about the rules, Info Junkie had to look it up and he had to show us what rule is it and show it. So it's G7 is where it says driver switch midway through the match. Where do they have to match? Uh, what if they're both touching the remote at 30 seconds? Is that allowed? Uh, do you have to throw the remote? What if you drop the remote? Like, it's all outlined what you can and cannot do. And if someone has a question, it's that year, age old, look it up. You got to look it up in the manual, and you always still have to point to the rest of the team. Where does it say? G7 states driver switch controllers midway through the match. So, anyway, this is some advice I've gotten from every coach. We pull, we'll send out a post survey and say, what's advice you'd give to every first year teacher? And all of them say, go to one more than one competition. So that's the advice from the hundreds and hundreds of first year coaches, second year coaches, coaches that have been doing this for years. They say, go to more than one competition. So that's me passing it along to you, said it, I'm reminding you. And then how do you sign up for a competition? I'm not gonna spend time right now, but you can watch a video of me walking you through how to sign up for a competition. And I would tell you honestly, do it now. It's like procrastinating. If you wait until your robot's done and built, you'll never be satisfied with your robot and you'll never sign up for a competition. If you sign up for a competition now, that whole procrastinating thing is your kids will work, you know, work for the first five, six, seven weeks. And then all of a sudden week eight, they're like, oh my gosh, my robot doesn't work. It's not scoring a lot of points. We have a competition in two weeks. We got to bust butt. We got to go faster. We got to work harder. Week nine. Cancel school, we have to build our robot. No school, robot only. No more lunch, no more eating, no more sleeping. Robots, robots, robots. So make sure uh, that you sign up for a competition to give you a little fire under your kids. Uh, fire under your kids, that sounds weird. To give a little, eh, we'll just not use that analogy. To motivate your kids to work towards a deadline. How about that? All right, rounding up the quarter. 28 minutes to go. All right, coaching robot competition. Uh, how to coach a robotics team. I suggest you build, oh, dang it, sorry, right, I'm using an old PowerPoint and that is not correct. I say you build, the PowerPoint you're looking at is correct. You build the clutch bot and I'm gonna show you in a, a, a link here in a second. The clutch bot is the new robot that you can build. There's instructions just like Legos that tell you step, step by step on how to build the clutch bot. Um, we're having, we have an intern named Macy and she started building ClutchBot today and I believe it'll take her about an hour and a half to build. Um, with kiddos, it always takes a little bit more time. Have students sketch out ideas. Oh, I didn't also tell you, use you by stuff that we bought you. You know what? I, I'm not going to tell you right now. I'm sorry. We bought you extra parts is what I'll tell you and I'll show you what that looks like here in a second. So. Have students sketch out ideas before they um, build on the robot. Have students prototype. And what I, I used to say with popsicle sticks, but we buy you so many extra parts, you're gonna have extra, you might, and I'm not gonna say you'll be swimming in parts, but it'll be close. Um, and uh, so yeah, have your kids build prototypes off to the side that they're not part of the robot. Try not to start over. Kids get frustrated, they don't like it, and they're like, let's take this apart and start over. No, 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 no. If it took you three practices to get to a point, you probably only have like an appendage, an arm, a gear that needs to be changed out. The slides are length. Just fix what's the problem, not the whole pro the whole robot's not the problem. The drivetrain is not the problem. It's probably just the arm or the hand or the claw or whatever you're building, uh, the part that's that not working. So don't start over. And then practice, practice, practice. Um, 
our robot season was six weeks long and week five was our deadline that I gave my students because the, the last week was for only driving and we never made modifications. That's ideal, um, but it doesn't always happen. We just run out of time. So make sure that you are driving and practicing a lot. Um, I wanna ask you a question. I haven't asked you guys a question in a while. How will you measure success? Let's say it is May, school is out, maybe it's June, and you're sitting by the pool, sipping on a margarita, getting drunk because you're not teaching, you're reminiscing about the school year, and you'll look back at your robot season and be like, you know what, I was successful because, shoot it out, why were you successful? Kids want to try another year, they had fun, teamwork, measure success, did the kids learn and have fun, to keep doing it, yes, yes. These are all the right reasons, and I, I'm just reminding you, please do not get lost in competition. I know some of you may have come from like a football or basketball background or track or softball, baseball, whatever it might be, the soccer mentality. I mean, we've all been to these soccer games where parents are screaming at the kids and, and being so brutal and mean and screaming at the refs. Robot competitions are so much different. Your robot breaks, it is not unlikely for the other team next to you or near you to go out of the way to help you. A robot battery uh, breaks, doesn't work, overheats, isn't charged. Team next to you, unlike, it is very likely that they'll say, here, you can use our battery. Heck, keep it. I'm not kidding. It is such a nice, generous uh, community of supporters, robot coaches. Anytime I get to talk to returning coaches, I say, please help out the newbies, the rookies, all of you listening to me right now because you've all been there. You've been clueless, not knowing what to do, and you have the stress and anxiety. So please lean on other coaches that have been there. Get out of this mentality that other coaches are your enemy and we're gonna destroy the other teams and robots. This should be in a community of acceptance. And I'll tell you, there are a few turds out there. You know, There's, there's a handful of turds uh, that are just jerks and they ruin it for everyone. So I can't tell you everyone's all kumbaya and, and nice, uh, but we try to, to create a community, and it is so neat. It's so weird the first time something doesn't work, and you have someone from another team trying to help you out. And you're like, this is weird. I mean, just think of, like, Bill Belichick. If a quarterback from the other team gets hurt, Bill Belichick is secretly like, ha, 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 we're going to win. Not in robotics. They're like, I need you to do well because you're my alliance partner. So maybe they're being selfish, but they want you to be successful um, so that you guys are all successful together. Anyway, um, I'm telling you, I measure success on this, all the things that you guys just mentioned. I want your kids to have fun, a good experience, learn something. I don't care about trophies, and neither should you. There will be a time where you can start thinking about being more competitive, and I don't think that time is until at least your second year. You need to get your first year under your belt. Your kids need to get one year of experience. Next year, you can start thinking about how to become a little bit more competitive, and we have a training that we do. It's a full eight-hour day that we break down how to go to the next level from rookie coach to more of an advanced veteran coach. Um, this should be a student-run, student-built, adult-organized. You should not ever touch the robot, and you should never let any adults touch the robot. This is your student's robot team. So if it robot sucks, it's because your team, <laughs> it's not because your kids suck. But if the robot sucks, it's because your kids build a robot that sucks, okay? So don't let your adult mentor take it home and build it. You shouldn't take it home and build it. You shouldn't have any moms or dads coming in building the robot. It's the kid's robot. Let them figure it out, okay? Um, no dad and mom bots. You're going to go to competitions and be like, there's no way someone, a kid built that. You know what? That's not your problem. Don't worry about it. Like, that's their problem, okay? Um, there's no crying in robots. I like that one. This is our executive director, Laura Dodd. Say there's no crying in robots. She tells that to her kids and adults. I always have a, a team meeting before a competition with the parents where I set expectations on how we treat other teams at competitions. I always say, I never ever want to hear you talk trash about another team. I don't care where you are because you never know who is listening. So you keep those comments to yourself because we've all been trash teams at one point. So anyway, um, Bree said, can you comment on the number of competitions if there are, will be more and reinforce and go ahead and register now if they don't have a team assembled? Yes, register now. I, I can't tell you enough, register now. How many competitions? I can't tell you. I know there'll be more than 123, which we had last year. Last time I heard it, we had close to 130, I think, from Randy. 
and they'll keep be they'll be slowly being added. Um, I'll tell you right now, uh, some events have already signed up. Bree just said I think we're at 140. So <laughs> last time I talked to Randy, uh, it's already grown. So anyway, uh, sign up now. Even if your team's not assembled, again, that is going to be the fire under your. I need to, I need to come. That is going to be your goal to help you meet that deadline by setting a, a, a competition and tell put that on the board and say. Guys, December 15th, we get we got we have two months. That's the, our deadline, December 15th, and remind them every competition or every practice that that's your competition deadline. We can't extend it. There's no extension. You know, your kids always like to, oh, I didn't have time to do my homework. I want an extension. No extension. That competition's happening with or without us. We're gonna either score one point or 50 points. So who it's gonna be? So that's a great way to to motivate your kids. All right, um, rounding it up here. Almost done. 20 minutes. We'll be, we'll be done. Um, I like this stress graph, and I said in the beginning, this is a fun little part I showed you, is pre-grant, you guys either applied for the grant, or how many of you had your principal apply for you? I didn't even ask, how many of you are principals? Anyone a principal here? And if, and I'm wondering, did anyone principal force them to be the robotics coach? Does anyone have the guts to admit it? Hmm. Maybe everyone signed up for the grant themselves, that's okay. My principal applied, not forced. Well, Sherry, that's great. Um, I have heard from coaches, sometimes a principal will apply and they'll say, you're gonna be the robotics coach. I say in that, if a principal applied and gave it to you, pay as a compliment because they trust you. And it kind of sucks in the work environment that if you do good things, you're probably going to get more work. Um, Bree and I can both attest to that. We, I think, do good things and we have a very full plate because of it. So take it as a compliment. If you get asked to do extra things, it's because you do good things. And if you applied for the grant, some of you are saying, you know what, um, I don't know what the heck I just got myself. So you apply for the grant, you're smooth sailing, you get award and you're like, what the heck? Uh oh, I don't know anything about robotics. I don't know anything about coaching. I don't know anything what a robot is. So you go to this PD, we're here to help you. Hopefully you leave tonight going, I got this. You probably are a little nervous that you're a month behind. But I've already told you, you can do this. We're here to help, you got this. Robot season starts, it's fun. Midway through your robot season, four, five, six weeks in, you're not, your robots in parts, it fell, it broke, it hasn't built, the kids are arguing and frustrating, you're like, ah, shh, and you, you put in a four-letter word. We each have our own four-letter word. Mine are usually darn. Breeze are really extreme sometimes. We have, we have no time. Every single team, no matter how experienced you are, I've been coaching for almost 20 years, I never have enough time. I never feel ready and prepared. Whether I'm a first year coach or a 20 year veteran, you'll never have enough time. And right before the competition, when you walk into the door at your first event, you're gonna say, what the heck did I just get myself into? And you're gonna be nervous, you're gonna be freaked out. You're gonna, I told you it's gonna be chaos. But after the event, you're gonna go, wow, this is fun. You go to your second competition, this is awesome, this is fun. So. Please, please, please know that there is light at the end of the tunnel over here. You all will get through it, and every coach, no matter their level of experience, goes through the same type of stress and anxiety. So we will all be here before an event, and we'll all be down here after our first event. So you just have to say the light at the end of the tunnel is getting through that first competition and survival. So that's it. And at the end, you'll all be robot masters. Yay! Um, here's the seven steps to get help. Number one, REC has a website. There's a lot of useful information in there. Check it out. There's a forum or the Coach's Corner. Forum is worldwide. Coach's Corner is just a little Facebook private group of Indiana Vex IQ coaches, okay? Uh, Tech Point, this is the resource page I said I was gonna refer to. I didn't really show much on there, but let me go back to it. On our robot resource, Robot resource page, uh, YouTube video playlist, how to organize a team, how to register a team, how to register a second team, how to sign up for a competition, um, VEX competition links, uh, the game animation, the game manual. Oh my gosh, Bree. Bree, can you make a note for me that these links are last year's game? And that's embarrassing. Oh my goodness, I don't know how I noticed that and no one said anything. This is last year's game, but uh, tomorrow it'll be updated with this year's animation, this year's manual, 
this year's referee videos. Um, so that will be updated. Thanks, Bree. And then um, here's a great link. 101 things I wish I knew before my first competition. Tip for preparing for an event. Like there's just so many resources that we, we uh, kind of scoured the internet for you and piled up in, in one nice little packaged area. So always look here whenever you don't know something. And then I think all of you should get an assistant or a helper, someone to help you out uh, coaching. So think about that. Um, robot, uh, I think, uh, oh, I went over this already. This is the robot map. A neighboring elementary school or middle school or even a high school robotics team that you have, find, see if you can find anyone in your community to help you out or go to another robot practice around to see what it's like or ask them to come meet with you or become pen pals or texting buddies or go grab drinks and just talk about things. So it'd be nice to meet another coach in your community and we can help connect you. Um, robot parts competition, you can ask Randy Decker. Anything about the grant or coaching, please ask us. Um, I'm not gonna go over this too much, but basically this is what I do over my first few meetings. Um, each of these might take a little bit extra time, but I start with going over the rules of the game. I can talk about building the robot. Dang it, this is outdated too. It says flex bot, it should be clutch bot. Um, and so anyway, this is just a quick overview of a schedule that I, I might use. Um, and you might have to do some of these where it says build flex bot. You might have to do that in the second, third, fourth, and fifth meeting, um, depending on how much time it takes. Design process, this is ever going, never ending. You brainstorm, you prototype, you test, you redesign, figure out what's wrong, and then you repeat to improve it. So you go back to the drawing board, but you never start over, you're just improving. So don't build, take the robot completely apart. You're just trying to solve the single problem, not start over. Um, this is what I think all of you should have, is an assistant coach. This could be a spouse, this could be your um, son or daughter that you know knows technology this could be another coach or another uh, teacher at your school administrator or a parent um, this could be the person that you know that uh, knows how to fix things you know your your toilet breaks you don't want to call the plumber you know that person that in the neighborhood that knows how to fix things maybe that'd be a great person to have as a, a coach this is going to help you survive this is the most common you by yourself so try to get away from this I did this and got burnt out I did this for 10 years and this was overwhelming. I had 120 students on my team and I was the head and assistant and treasurer and robot coach and uh, robot design. I did everything and it was overwhelming. I had parents uh, helped me. Um, I had some teachers from time to time that would help me, but I never had an dedicated assistant that was every single practice. You want that, otherwise you get burnt out. Um, team structure for your students. This is not what you'll have because you're only going to have six kids. This is most likely what you will have with six kids. A group that builds the robot, a group that works on programming, a group that works on the field elements, rules, and scoring. And if you have extra kids, you need help, uh, need something else to do, they can do like t-shirt design, uh, a, a t-shirt name, or a, a team name. You should have a name for your team. Um, work on a website, things like that. This is the most common, a build team, a programming team, and then everything else, the driving, the scoring, the rules, the elements, the field. Uh, I don't have time to tell this story, but in short, these are a group of kids I've met at a world championship. They had the worst robot. I was a judge here and I gave them an award because they knew everything about the robot. They built it and they were able to relate. These are second graders, first year team. They were able to relate how they learned about things in the real world and related to the robot. They had a rack and pinion gear right here. Um, on the robot, they had a bevel gear down here. Even though I had the worst designed robot and didn't score a lot of points, if you remember my philosophy, I don't care about points. I care about students knowing, learning, solving problems, and these kids were able to communicate with me as a judge, which you'll have a competition. The adults will talk to your kids and ask them questions, and they have to communicate what they did and how they overcame problems. And I was very impressed by this team and gave them the judges award for it at the World Championship. Keep it simple, silly. This is very good advice for you and your kids. Kids are going to want to try to do every single thing. We're going to put balls in the cubes and put them in the corner and then put the green cubes, balls on top of the green cubes. We'll stack five because you get five and stack it on top of the platform. Yeah, that's everything, and even the best teams aren't going to be able to do that. So be careful. 
that's you can't you focus on one thing and one thing only and then move on to the next what's the first thing we do drive and put a, a cube into a corner great we did it I want you to keep doing that like shooting free throws do it ten times great now what can we do all right now we can put balls on top of cubes and put them in the corner great do that ten times now do it a hundred times great let's move on to the next thing so don't try to do ten things at once one thing and move on to the next Coaching tip, I think this is very important that you practice as much as you design the robot. So make sure you have kids driving the robot. They should not be driving the robot the first time at a competition. That's a lot of pressure to put in front of the kids. All right, kid of parts. I have 10 minutes and I'm going to go quick. You will be getting a Vex IQ Super Kit, which is everything you see here. It's a ton of parts and it's everything you need to build the clutch bot, which I'll show you here in a second, with extra parts. And then because we like you so much, we bought you a foundation add-on kit, which is everything that you saw in this video or in this picture, in addition to extra parts, but it doesn't have any motors, batteries, electronics, remotes, or any radios. So this is just snap together parts to help build extra. So you get both of these and that field. Inside there, there's going to be a little tray. I like to organize it like this. You can just print this off and tape it to the inside cover or put this on your wall so it's nice and organized. I have a video that walks through, that's me, walking through everything that's in that kit. So when you get your kit, you can go through this video and it'll show you what everything is. There's the controller, there's the brain, there's how the brain works, here's radios, here's batteries, here's a charger, here's how the charger and batteries work. Again, I'm not going to go over all this because it's all in the video and we only have ten, nine minutes left. Uh, cables, mo motors, you get four of these. These are the beams. These are the connectors. These connectors go in those beams to snap together and make the robot come together. The instructions tell you how to do this. Um, here's corner beams. Here's standoffs. Here's shafts. Gears, pulleys. Pulleys are different than gears because you notice this is a groove and gears have teeth. Don't get them confused. And there's even bevel gears here or crown gears. Uh, these are actually crown gears that have a uh, uh, teeth going 90 degrees from the axis. So you don't want to actually use these most likely on anything you do, unless you're that cute little Boston team that figured out how to use a crown gear. Um, you have sensors. So here's a touch sensor. Here's an LED touch sensor that is only interacted with a finger. People use this for starting their program. Here's a distance sensor that tells you how far away something is. Here's a gyro sensor that tells you the rotation or angle of your robot if you wanted a precise angle. Very complex, you'll probably never use this. Color sense, you'll probably never use this at your first year. Color sensor, you'll never use it this year, and it's a, most teams never ever use this, but this can detect color, which is a neat activity, but not really, it does not apply to this year's game. Um, driving out of the gate, your robot will drive like this, joystick mode. It's written in your manual, I'll show you where that is. But it's basically like a tank. You hit both of them forward and it goes forward. You hit one up and one down, it goes right. You hit both down, it goes backwards. You hit one down, one right, it goes left. It's just like a like a uh, 360 degree lawnmower, or I like to say a tank. A lot of videos in addition. Oops, a lot of videos in addition to what I applied right here. You can click on this link and it'll take you and walk you through all of the sensors and how they work. So. In addition to what I did in my video, this is even more in-depth. There are two manuals in there. There's a manual uh, for the Vex IQ Clawbot. In my opinion, you can just throw this away or put it on a manual or a filing cabinet somewhere. You don't need this because this won't be a helpful robot for you to build. Um, I've had some coaches say on Coach's Corner they've used this because it's a simple robot for picking up things, but you'd really have to modify the robot to pick up the balls and cubes for this year's robot, which is fine. So. I had some people do this, but I'll show you ClutchBot, which is more the preferred for first year teams. And then this manual is all of the instructions you need for the brain, the battery, the remote, all the electronics are in here. And I even highlight what are the important pages in here, because some people don't like reading manuals, but here's the important pages. All right, if you go to Vex's website, here are all of the different instructions you have um, to build. You can click on any of these links and it will take you to a robot build. But I'm going to click on clutch right now and bring over my screen. Oops, it brings me to here, which if I click on clutch right now, this is a lot more pages in the manual. I think it's like 50 or 60. 
48, less than my two numbers, and it is snapped together instructions just like Legos. So if I scroll down to step one, a little more complicated, but you've got a, a beam here that is two by 10, so two holes by 10 holes, and it's going to connect to this beam here and with these little connectors. So you'll need 22 of these connectors and 16 of these connectors, and you're gonna connect to that two by four and two by eight, and it says everything listed right there, what you need, and you connect it, and off you go and you build it. It's a little more complex than Legos, but they're better than Legos, they're so cool. All right, that's what I think, oops, sorry. Clutch spot in the bottom right corner. That's what I think you sh your students should build the very first. It, it, it works, but it's flimsy. If you look in the animation video that you did as homework, you'll see it driving in there. And if you look closely, you can see there's little stabilizers here. It's very top heavy. So when this is sitting up, it's fully extended, the robot almost wants to fall over. So it has some limitations. It's not the best design, but it's a great starting point. And your kiddos should modify this to make it better. All right. Um, I, a homework assignment was the vocabulary drive base. You should not have your kids strip the robot down past the drive base. So if they're not happy with this claw, you can take the claw off and start with this, but they shouldn't strip it down even more. It is really hard for a first year team to try to design a robot drive base. You can try that next year. Um, Four, elementary teachers. I forgot to say who's elementary and who's middle. I've got four minutes. I'm going to try to talk really fast to get you guys out of here. If you're elementary, there is a Project Lead the Way activities for you to do with your students in your class that aren't on the robotics team. So if you have six kids on your robotics team and 24 in your class, the neat little activity, you click here, you can download it, and it uses all the equipment that you have uh, that we're going to send you. It's a fun little activity. Some of you are already Project Lead the Way launch act, uh, teachers. It's the Tiger activity. It's, you read a story where these kids go to the zoo, a tiger falls in a ravine, you've got to save it using simple machines, using the new science standards that came out with three years ago, the incline plane, lever, and pulley. you got to put them together, make a complex machine to save the tiger. Fun little activity. All right, I said that quick. So if you're an elementary teacher and we'd like for you to try the Project Leader activities, here are 10 things that you all have to do as part of the grant requirement. You've already done three of them. Must be an educator that works through first through eighth graders. You did it. Awesome. Done. Must not already have a VEX IQ elementary or middle school VEX IQ team. If you do, don't tell us. We already gave you the award. Congratulations. You got number two done. Applicant must have the ability to assemble a robotics team of at least three students. You're going to have a problem keeping it under six. So you'll easily be able to get this one done. Agrees to attend a four-hour training professional development. You already did two hours with me. You did homework before, and you're going to have homework after about all the resources I just unloaded on you for to look at. You'll get it. And in fact, Bree, if you remind your, help remind us, Bree, we will be sending you a CRU certificate for your CRU um, certification, teacher license. Uh, we're going to be sending you eight-hour um, credits that will align with the career readiness credits you can thank DOE and Superintendent McCormick for that. Um, they'll align with the um, credits that a lot of people were you know, really upset about, that they had to do these career readiness, 15-hour credits, that you can apply them to those. So thank you for being awesome, and we will send you guys in the follow-up email the CRUs. And you must, if you're an elementary teacher, we're asking you that you complete the Project Lead the Way activity this year or next. We'll send out additional information about that. Last page, and then we're done, everybody. Um, must coordinate one team to go to one competition. All of you are going to go to one. You're going to love it, and you're going to want to go to two. We ask that you put our logo on any shirts, websites, flyers, and other promotional material. We will send information on. I think Bree either sent you a newsletter and said, don't read this until after training, or we'll be sending you a newsletter. Bree, you can remind me, or maybe you already told them. But it has so much information that you need to know, including where the logos are. So um, there's a newsletter coming out where you already got it, and you should look at it if you already got it, and it goes over the logos. Agrees to have a team for at least two years. I understand, dang it, I'm gonna be over. I understand that there are some of you that will become principals next year, superintendents, CEOs, move on, become mothers, and quit work and love you know, the, the home life. Whatever might happen to you, and I say that because a majority of our coaches we've noticed that don't return is because of uh, maternity leave. So there's something fun about robotics that brings out babies. 
Um, so uh, if this happens, we would like for the robot to stay at the school and we would like for you to find another teacher to replace you, which you're irreplaceable, obviously. But please keep the robot team going for at least two years, hopefully forever. And then um, number nine, this is important. So let me, um, let me talk about 10 and then I'll go back to nine and then we're done. 10, agrees to complete a classroom to career activity during the school year. Uh, we will send out additional information. It's basically we've created or want to create a little activity for all teachers to help connect why robotics is beneficial and relates to careers that students should have and do someday, like scientists, engineers, and all the skills they're learning can apply to a real job. So we'll do an activity for that. We'll send it out to you, and we'd like for you to try it out with your team. And then finally, this is the fun part. I know I'm losing you and it's been two hours, so I appreciate all of your listening and patience. Here's the last part you wanna hear. We'll be sending a pre and post survey to you. Bree will be sending out the pre-survey as part of the newsletter. So the pre-survey is going out. We want you and your coaches, or you and your students to fill that out. If you do, are you ready for this? We will be sending you a $50 gift card to Amazon if you fill out the pre-survey and your students fill out the pre-survey, this is only for robot educators that receive the grant. I know some of you are listening as assistants or as a refresher, but if you are a robot educator that got the grant from us and you complete the pre and post survey, you get a $50 Amazon gift card. That is a small, almost insult stipend. I think all of you deserve hundreds and thousands of dollars as coaches. Not all of you will get paid some of you will you deserve it um this is doe saying what can we do to help and i said get teachers paid and they're like okay how many teachers and we told them like over 900 and they're like oh my gosh like money divided by 900 teachers doesn't go very far um as we all know and because that's what our salaries look like so it's a small stipend from doe it's a thank you for being a coach and then there's a round two We'll be sending you a post survey in April. If you and your teach your you and your kids fill out the post survey, we'll send you out another fifty dollar gift card. This is like Oprah right now. We're just handing out money. So a hundred dollars for being awesome for doing these things. Really, it's the pre and post survey. Fifty for the pre, fifty for the post. Send you a hundred dollars, and I that's a small token of appreciation. If any of you are assistant coaches, um, you could elbow your your coach and say, hey, I heard you got a $50 and a $100 gift card, and you know they should be splitting that with you, I think. Um, but honestly, I think all of you should get paid. You deserve it. Um, we are, Bree and I, working hard, hard, talking and working with DOE to get more money for all of you. I know we don't do it for the money, but we cannot continue to say we, don't, we do it for the kids, not the money, because eventually you need to be rewarded for this, and we need to keep you guys in the classroom, and we need to keep you coaching robotics, and when football coaches get paid and basketball pay, uh, coaches get paid and not for robotics, I think that's ludicrous. So uh, we're fighting for you. We're doing the best we can. That is all I have. I crammed that in two hours and two minutes. Thank you, everyone, so much. Thank you, Bree, so much. Thank you, Juliet, Bree's little daughter, for being patient during this whole thing. Um, I thank you guys for everything. Uh, Bree will send out a follow-up email with everything. Please let us know if we can help out. I can't wait to see you guys at a competition. Um, don't be a stranger. Keep doing awesome things. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye. See you tomorrow, Bree. And end. Oh, if anyone has any questions, I probably should have asked, and I think you've already asked them to Bree, but if anyone has any questions, you know what? I'm tired. I'm going to say good night. <laughs> Email us if you have questions. Any meeting.